Welcome to This Week in South Carolina, I'm Gavin Jackson. This week, the University of South Carolina announced a $1.5 million gift to enhance the school's Center for Civil Rights History and Research. The center's director, Dr. Bobby Donaldson, joins us to discuss its importance and recent debate on legislation involving critical race theory happening at the State House. But first, more from this week. Money was the order of business this week at the State House. The Senate approved more than $2 billion in federal funding, including a plan for $525 million that was part of a federal settlement over plutonium storage at the Savannah River site. That money will fund roads, water and sewer infrastructure, economic development projects, and more in the SRS region. The Senate also approved plans for part of the $2.5 billion in American Rescue Plan Act money the state received without any Republican congressional support last March. Senate Republicans and Democrats had no problem approving $435 million for already planned transportation infrastructure projects, as well as hundreds of millions of dollars in grants for rural water infrastructure upgrades and $400 million for broadband. The bill was sent to the House, where lawmakers this week passed a very similar spending plan. Their differences will soon be hashed out. State economists on Tuesday said tax revenue has grown substantially, giving lawmakers billions in additional money to budget with. More than a dozen prominent House Republicans joined the governor to push for income tax reductions that would cost $600 million. That's the same amount recurring funds grew by for a total of $1.5 billion in growth, along with $2.5 billion in non-recurring dollars. Yeah, the, no the normal trend is going to be increasing. We are, we are confident. We are on the way up. We, the, the federal money did help, but the conservative policies that we had in, in this state are, are what have allowed this, this to occur. And we, we have businesses from all over the world that are contacting us that want to, want to come to South Carolina. We have businesses in the state that want to grow. We have a lot of needs in education and other things, but this is the way to answer those needs. This, this will, un, a tax cut unleashes industry and business and the economy to thrive. The Senate unveiled an even bigger tax cut plan on Thursday, though economists urge caution as the economy will soon settle down from its stimulus sugar highs. Another big storyline out of the State House this week was a five-hour-long House Education Committee hearing on five bills dealing with critical race theory, a controversial yet ill-defined topic that isn't taught in K-12 schools, and which State Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman spoke about. There is significant debate as to what is and what is not appropriate. I believe we, and this committee, have a monumental task and responsibility before us to ensure that students, parents, and educators know what can be taught in our classrooms and what cannot. Parents should have a clear picture of what their children are learning, and teachers should not be forced to second-guess their instruction, or worse, not teach something important for fear of retaliation. No action was taken on the bills, but committee chairwoman Rita Allison says it was the first of several hearings on the controversial matters the committee will hold. And now to discuss the importance of Black History Month and a major investment in civil rights education in the state is Dr. Bobby Donaldson. He's a USC professor of history and director of the school's Center for Civil Rights History and Research. Professor Donaldson, welcome back. Thanks. So glad to be with you again. So, Dr. Donaldson, let's just start off about this big news this week. We have a lot to talk about, but I want to talk about this huge investment that your Center uh, for Civil Rights History and Research just got this week, $1.5 million. Tell us about the Center for people who don't know about it and what this money will do for you in the future. So the uh, Center for Civil Rights History and Research at the University of South Carolina was established in the fall of 2015 upon the receipt of the papers of Congressman James Clyburn. As a part of that gift, Congressman Clyburn very much wanted to see an entity on the university's campus that would take various collections like his own and use them for teaching purposes, use them to advance research, and to use them for public engagement. And uh, over the many years, we've been working to do just that. In 2019, there was a large exhibit of many of these materials on display in the Ernest F. Hollings Library. Those items were on display for six months. And at the conclusion of the exhibit, those items went back into the very boxes and they went back in storage. And there was a real push among many to find a way to keep that material um, active and alive. And ultimately what we decided to do was to develop a smaller exhibit that would travel throughout South Carolina and ultimately around the, around the country 
that would tell the story, the largely unknown story of civil rights uh, in South Carolina. So presently, the exhibit called Justice for All uh, is on display in Sumter, and it will soon go uh, to Orangeburg, to Georgetown, and other places in the, in the state. To help support that ex exhibit, we were soliciting um, contributions and um, gifts from individuals and from corporations. And we had a contact at Williams Companies, mm -hmm. and her name is Kelly Adams. And Kelly has roots in South Carolina. And she was very um, engaged in what we were discussing and seemed very supportive. And so she went back to her company, a company I did not know, to ask would they be willing to support our work. And so on Tuesday, they said clearly they were willing to support the work. Uh, and they made a three-year commitment of $1.5 million uh -huh. to support the teaching research and in public engagement of the center. Uh, and so, uh, Gavin, it's a monumental gift for us and for the work we do. It's an affirmation of the work of many over, over several years. And so we're re really excited about where this takes us uh, next uh, down the road. And Professor, you, you have so many stories to tell, and that's why we love having you on the show. Uh, give us one that this exhibit will help teach folks about. You know, there is so much civil rights history in our state. Uh, you know, there are so many books written about it. I've been reading several of them by some of your colleagues, just about, you know, the, the foundation of education lawsuits in the state, protests, boycotts, mm -hmm. things like that. Give us an example for folks maybe who have just moved to South Carolina or don't know our history that well that they should know about. Well, I'll cite just two examples from the year 1954. Uh, many people know that one of the uh, most influential Supreme Court rulings in the 20th century is the Supreme Court ruling called Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, a, a Supreme Court ruling that chisels away at legal segregation uh, in this country. And some may not know that although it's Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, it's a series of cases, cases packaged together. And one of those cases is called Briggs versus Elliott, which was a school case out of Clarendon County, South Carolina, in a little community called Somerton. And today, Somerton is just a small dot on a map along I-95. And many people not, may not know in that small dot town, there was a powerful case called Briggs versus Elliott that helps transform this nation uh, and transform the country. That's just one example from 54. And, and Gavin, the Brown v. Board ruling took place on May 17th of 1954. And little over a month later, there was a incident in downtown Columbia of a 20-year-old woman who was originally from East Over, South Carolina. And her name was Sarah Mae Fleming. Uh, Sarah Mae Fleming was on her way to work one day, and she sits in a, a seat on a bus on Main Street in Columbia a seat which was legally reserved for white people. Mm -hmm. And we don't know what motivated this young woman to sit in that seat that day, but when she was told by the bus driver to get up and move to the back, she did not obey. She did not believe that she had any reason to leave that seat. Um, when she tries to get off the bus after being harassed, uh, she is hit, she is uh, punched in the stomach, mm -hmm. she is wounded, and she ultimately seeks legal counsel uh, and is championed by a civil rights giant named Majeska Simpkins. And she files a lawsuit against the owners of the bus company. And at that time, the owners of the bus company was a company called SCENG. So there's a very famous legal case called Fleming versus SCENG that sets the stage for the outlawing of segregation in public transportation. Mm -hmm. Now, nearly every textbook in our country will tell you about the story of Rosa Parks. It is a story that happened 17 months after Sarah Mae Fleming. Mm. But very few know really the story of, of Sarah Mae Fleming. And part of our hope is to amplify the important contributions of people like those in Somerton and people like Sarah Mae Fleming. A uh, very interesting backstory there, of course, and so many details and important anecdotes that folks really do need to learn about when we talk about history in our state. Uh, Professor, the announcement took place for that huge investment for the, for the Center for Civil Rights and History and Research on the Statehouse grounds outside of the African American Monument. Can you talk to us about the significance of holding that announcement there on that location? 
Well, I believe that we recognize that this was a major investment um, for this company. It was a major milestone for the university. And so we were looking for an appropriate backdrop and we could have easily have done it on the campus. But we were mindful that this center is, although housed here at the university, it is to be of a service to the state of South Carolina and to all citizens, all schools, all teachers, all students. And so to be on public grounds, um, to be in that space surrounded by these iconic um, emblems of, of, the, of, the, uh, of African-American history uh, was very appropriate, I think. Um, and in addition to that, when you think about the State House, uh, it is a place of tremendous history. Uh, it is a place of conflicting history. You have on those grounds uh, people who are pioneers uh, in advancing the cause of civil rights and justice. And you also have on those grounds monuments uh, and other public uh, pieces in tribute to those who were maintaining, defending adamantly uh, the status quo. And so for me, uh, this was a real moment of poetic justice to be at the African American Monument talking about citizens who dared to believe in a different future uh, mm -hmm. for the state of South Carolina, unlike others who have been commemorated uh, on those grounds. And we've previously talked about monuments, uh, the role of Confederate monuments in the state. So I'm not going to get into it again. People can go to our YouTube page and see that discussion from last year. But Professor Donaldson, I want to ask you about uh, the rise and in, in the, the role of misinformation in our society right now, especially when it comes to history. Uh, can you talk about what you've seen maybe either it's among your students or people you've interacted with, uh, some just misinformation out there that you'd love to clear up when it comes to history in South Carolina, specifically civil rights history? Well, I think part of what we know is the reason why we want to build up an archives and the reason why we're doing that, the, we, the reason why we're encouraging people to make sure they save and preserve valuable letters and photographs and even moving television footage is because it helps to fill in gaps. It helps to correct misconceptions. And so when someone says there was not much of a civil rights movement in South Carolina, we beg to differ. Let's look at the photographs of downtown demonstrations in Columbia, in Rock Hill, in Charleston, in Florence, in Denmark. Or let's look at letters written by kids from jail uh, in Rock Hill in 1961. There was a serious and critical movement in the state of South Carolina. Uh, and it is not one widely known uh, around the country. Um, there are a number of examples of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, being in South Carolina as early as the 1940s, when he was a very, very young man. Um, one of the, one I think, one of the amazing discoveries of people is to 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 to, to realize that someone like Malcolm X made an appearance in Columbia, South Carolina, in April of 1963. How do we know that? We have photographs of Malcolm X at the Columbia Airport. There are photographs of Malcolm X um, speaking at a small church near the C.A. Johnson High School in Columbia. There's a ticket that we have as part of our collection that says that Malcolm X was scheduled to speak at the Township Auditorium. And so, Gavin, there is a lot about the history of the civil rights movement in this country that could be seen through the lens and through the window of South Carolina if we make a determined effort to preserve that history and to make it available and accessible to the public. Mm -hmm. Which is what you're doing there at your center. Uh, Professor Donson, I want to ask you about just, you know, when people talk about race, you know, we have these debates, we have these discussions, especially in light of horrible situations. Look at George Floyd, look at the Mother Emanuel massacre. The list goes on, sadly, when it comes to race-based incidents, shootings, massacres. Uh, and then we talk about having discussions. We talk about trying to pass bills, but more importantly, a lot of times people say, we need to have this discussion. And some would say maybe we're doing it right now, here and there, especially in the wake of George Floyd's death. Uh, that summer was an explosive time for these situations. But then things wane, people start talking about different things, uh, politics really creep in, and then everyone starts saying, why are we talking about race so much all of a sudden, you know? And it's like, we haven't really had the discussion yet. So what do you say to people when they say, why is race always at the front and center of so many things? When we, when we previously talked about saying, we need to have this discussion, and then you have people saying, well, why do we have to keep talking about it? How do you, how do you answer that? How do you mesh with that? Because as you think about the long arc of, of democracy, the struggle for democracy in this country, uh, the long arc about constitutional rights, for me as a historian, it's very difficult to separate any of that 
from a discussion of, of race and race relations uh, in this country. Um, and this is, this is what, what I teach every day about the civil rights movement. And to talk about civil rights, it, it, it simply cannot be the heroic story of the demonstrator or the heroic story of, of Rosa Parks. It has to be the story of a much more complicated nature. It has to be the story of the opposition uh, these persons face. It has to be the profound opposition of state leadership uh, during that time. And I think part of it is it's an uncomfortable uh, history, but it's one that we should not run away from. And I think part of what we're seeing now is an effort to silence and an effort to erase some aspects of our history. Um, and I think that's a very, very dangerous proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the work we do at the center is to base our interpretation and our presentation of history on the sources that are before us and to use those sources to tell as comprehensive a history as we can. And so I'm troubled by some of the politics we see today, and it's ironic, Gavin, Tuesday, we were celebrating this major investment by um, a corporate entity in, in the support of the work we're doing. And on Wednesday, the next day, there were over five hours of testimony about history, education, and critical race theory in South Carolina. Yep. And Professor, you kind of walked right into my second question there because I was at that hearing, that House Education Committee hearing at the State House, where we saw State Superintendent of Ed Education Molly Spearman talking about the, these bills, these five bills dealing with CRT, uh, which again is a very loosely defined thing. Even lawmakers who are proposing these bills really couldn't come up with a working definition of what critical race theory is. A lot of people don't know what it is, but they know that they're afraid of it. Uh, do you have a working definition or do you tell people what it is when they ask you because of your stance with, in the history department? No, I can tell you what civil rights history is. That's what I'm trained to do. Mm -hmm. um, critical race theory is a loaded term, but I do believe that there is no serious deliberations about what it has meant intellectually and what it has meant scholarly, particularly among legal scholars uh, who have helped shape that field. It's almost as though it's now becoming a buzz, buzzword uh, to capture all things related to diversity and equity uh, in, in education. And as I said before, I believe that is a very dangerous uh, proposition um, and a road to travel. Uh, Gavin, I've taught at the University of South Carolina for 22 years. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here teaching diverse students from diverse backgrounds. Uh, and what I see now is an effort to, um, to kind of put a break on that type of teaching. Um, not long ago, there was a professor uh, in Florida who it was a civil rights historian who someone sort of accused of being a critical, critical race theory. Uh, and this man's um, uh, public speech was canceled as a result. And again, I think when we move in that direction, of trying to censor scholarship, uh, that is a very dangerous direction to go in. Mm -hmm. And the superintendent at that hearing said, uh, this is a dangerous path we could be going down. We have to be very, very careful. Teaching history comprehensively and accurately is key. Partisanship and passing along personal biases are not. So I think that's a, another issue too that we've kind of seen come to the forefront, especially with parents teaching from home, uh, children being remote during this pandemic. You know, a current, a current events lesson in you know, high school or middle school all of a sudden becomes a worrisome uh, fodder for critical race theory when it's just discussing the events of uh, the day, essentially. It's true. And, I, you know, I come with this as a Ph.D. and academic scholar in, in civil rights and African-American history. But I also come to this as a citizen and as a father of an 11 year old and a 15 year old who are in our public schools. Uh, and I want to make sure that the the, the histories they are taught is a history that reflects the history that I've done work on for two decades. So what you do not want is this perception that, you know, democracy is an uncomplicated process because our state is a, is a rich state in, in so many respects. And you want to be sure that the students of this state come away with a very strong knowledge of South Carolina history uh, but also the role the state has played in the country. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about critical race theory too, I mean, you can say it examines the way policies and laws perpetuate systemic racism. Um, I don't, uh, for an example, I don't remember ever learning about redlining as a, as a child or even as a, 
a college student, but until I moved to Florence, South Carolina, where I was covering city council meetings, and they're talking about doing a, a neighborhood revitalization plan, a comprehensive plan to revitalize neighborhoods that have been affected by pa problems in the past, like redlining. These neighborhoods where black owners of homes can't get interest rates or, or even loans to fix up their houses to improve neighborhoods because of the way that those neighborhoods have been historically treated. So would that be construed as critical race theory, just talking about redlining, a practice that was happening and maybe in some ways still happens today? It, it, what Again, I think because this is a loosely defined term by those who are kind of indicting the field, I mean, you want to be careful. I'm glad you picked up the example of, of Florence and redlining. So I mean, redlining was indeed a policy. You want to look at the implications of those policies on urban planning and urban development. And a perfect example of this, those who are in downtown Columbia who know the area around the state house. Well, that was an area impacted by redlining. Today, we know of the Greek village of the University of South Carolina. We know about the uh, Colonial Life Arena. You may know about the Dollar Moore School of Business. But unless you have a critical lens, you would assume those spaces were built on open lots, when in fact they were not. They were, they were built in the heart of a black neighborhood called Ward 1. Ward 1 that was deeply impacted by urban renewal and redlining. Ward 1, which has been a subject of many of my classes. Ward 1, which we work with those residents to develop exhibits and websites so that their history can be preserved, even though nearly every building of their neighborhood is now gone. Mm -hmm. And that's something actually when we talk about infrastructure and especially now with these major infrastructure investments being talked about, being debated in the state house, being passed into law in Congress and here as well. You know, I talked to SCDOT Secretary Christy Hall about the ramifications of such planning in the past. And she says now they are focused to make sure that they understand, you know, community concerns, also what they can do to help mitigate a lot of this, because that has always been a concern. And those are stories that haven't been told because a lot of those stories can't be told because people don't have the power in those neighborhoods in those areas. And again, that's history that isn't being taught. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and particularly when you look at highway construction historically and even now, uh, there's, there's a great deal of debate and controversy even in places like Charleston about how highway development ha is impacting historic black neighborhoods. And I think, again, for some people, these are just highways, seeds of asphalt going through communities not recognizing that it has a deep and adverse impact on the history and longevity of, of historic neighborhoods and communities. Mm -hmm. Professor Donaldson, we have about four minutes left, and I want to ask you uh, just about where this goes. I know you've kind of mentioned it uh, moments ago, but where do you see all of this going? Have we, have we been through a time in our history where we have faced such moments like this, where there's a really big push to get rid of the history? I mean, obviously, there have been some big moments, but has it ever been really this concerted? I mean, obviously, in the past it has happened, but how do you see this playing out to an extent now in the modern times? I wish I could be prophetic to tell you where we're going. Um, it is it's quite interesting, though, that in the last three or four years, history has become such a hot and button issue in ways it never has before, whether it's from monuments to curriculum. Um, so I don't know which way it shall go, but what I do know is that those of us who, be, who believe in teaching a comprehensive and in-depth history of this nation and of South Carolina should be vigilant. Um, Gavin, many people may not even know that in this state, as much as we're debating about critical race theory, there are actually laws on our books now that call for the teaching of African-American history in, in South Carolina. It's an over 30 years old mm -hmm. a measure that has been rarely discussed or rarely uh, enforced. Uh, and so there are already laws here that I think we should we should we should uh, examine and put into practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and lawmakers even passed a, a, a law last year citing a greater need for civics being taught in uh, institutions of higher education like your own, and including documents when it comes to African American heritage and the like. So it's interesting that we're talking about these bills right now, working through the state house that could essentially almost invalidate what's already been passed into law. So there's a lot going back and forth right now. But do you see any big movement on this actually happening and coming to fruition in this state, maybe based on our know. history? You, you know the General Assembly better than I do. And I think we'll see where all the noise goes. Mm -hmm. and, and we'll see whether or not there's a resolution that actually creates a stronger educational platform for our young people. You know, as, again, as, as a father and as a, as a citizen, uh, I hope that as much energy as we're now focusing on critical race theory, 
we can now channel on improving our public schools in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And Professor, with 30 seconds left, what should people be doing? I know you're talking about focusing on public schools, but if I'm a, a viewer, if I'm at home, what should I be doing? Should I be researching more into our history? How can people do this? What are some well, great resources? If you, if you want to know more about the civil rights history in South Carolina, I encourage you to visit the Civil Rights Center's website. I encourage you to visit my good friend Cecil Williams in Orangeburg. I encourage you to get ready for the new museum in Charleston. There, are, Even though we're having this debate, Gavin, there are some in entities and organizations around this state that are doing great work uh, to make sure that we have a strong and diverse history of, of South Carolina. Wonderful, and a lot to look forward to right there. That's Professor Bobby Donaldson. He's a USC history professor and he's director of the school's Center for Civil, Civil Rights History and Research. Thank you, Professor Donaldson. Glad to be with you. To keep you updated throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that I host twice a week that you can find on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.